Hi, I'm Josh Harlow, uh, and Hi, I'm Vilob. And we're going to talk a little bit about some uh, issues with the scheduler and various plans on going forward and where where the current state is and uh, how we uh, any pr proposal to go go ahead. Sure. So this is who we are. A little bit more details about us. Uh, Vilob, you can talk about yourself a little bit. Yeah. So I'm Vilob. I work for uh, uh, OpenStack at Yahoo. I'm part of the development team for OpenStack at Yahoo. Uh, I'm one of the Magnum Core contributors. I'm leading efforts across uh, for the cross-project Quota library, known as Delimiter, and cool. I have the Oslo project lead with me. <laughs> yeah, I'm Josh Harlow. I was I was working at the Yahoo group a little while ago, about a month ago, and then moved over at GoDaddy recently. Uh, the PTL now the PTL of Oslo, which is uh, if you haven't looked it up, you can just search on that one. A bunch of libraries I've created. They are very they're used in various places. I uh, was involved in the scheduler stuff more at Yahoo than I am right now, but here to help out and go through some of the details on what we saw and how we addressed it and where we'd like to maybe go, uh, so at least some ideas. So, sure. you want to talk about where we are? Yeah, so uh, what scale are we talking about? Uh, Yahoo, as we all know, that operates at an immensely huge scale. So uh, what scale uh, we operate at Yahoo is we have tens of thousands of VMs virtual machine instances. We have tens of thousands of OpenStack bare metal nodes. We have 30 plus clusters in six regions globally distributed across the globe. And uh, we have uh, hundreds of uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, non-OpenStack bare metal. Right. So managing all of these inventory and uh, operating at this scale and the challenges or the problems that we face at these scales are unique. And uh, you might be the first one to encounter these. And uh, yeah, and uh, first one maybe eventually to fix that. But uh, uh, yeah, the problems are unique at this huge scale. And sure. And I also want to mention the last point there. It's the non-OpenStack remote. They are integrated with OpenStack. There, there's some migration path. Uh, there's sort of an API uh, that people go through OpenStack, but there's a legacy system underneath it that we integrated with. This uh, was forget like the Kilo release or something, but it was, uh, we're moving to a more ironic model, or at least Yahoo is or was. So that last bullet point is, is sort of a mix of open, it's OpenStack, but it's also, it's OpenStack managed, but it's also connected into some legacy systems that do part of the work on that OpenStack and Ironic now do. So right. there's some switching over that's happening yeah. at least currently or what's happening when I was leaving. So yeah, this was sort of a little overview of what goes on in a scheduler. This is a, in a in sort of like the, what the Nova scheduler does. It's not specific to uh, cin like Cinder has a scheduler. These other guys have schedulers, but a little the workflow diagram of what's actually happening, which may not be a w known to everybody what actually goes on. Do you want to go through it a little bit? Yeah, sure. So what happens is uh, whenever a user initiates a request to boot a VM or boot any instance, uh, the request gets uh, <laughs> The uh, API receives the request, and then the conductor uh, is passed on the conductor, and then the conductor hands on the request to the scheduler, where the scheduler has a set of filters where, uh, and ways that it operates on. And once it uh, selects a host on which it wants to schedule an instance, uh, let's say a VM instance, and then that information is passed back to the conductor, and conductor eventually talks to the compute, which runs on the hypervisor to spin up that VM instance. So that's a gist of it, and uh, yeah, we can. There's, move some, there's, there's also number six there. It's yeah, interesting. so, so uh, you want me to talk? Yeah, about it, it's sort of if if this if that it's sort of an optimistic or it may not actually the compute node may not actually have the resources able to be able to satisfy the request at that point. So this for a VM would mean like I ran out of uh, I actually don't have enough vCPUs or whatever. Sorry, excuse me to make that request, so it will actually reschedule, and that may will start this whole like there's a little loop between. The conductor, or the scheduler, a compute node. There's a there's a possible sort of looping that can happen there. It's uh, called retries in Nova or whatever. It's sort of hidden. You don't necessarily see it, but there's actually retries that can go on there. And uh, the filtering process itself is sort of unique. I know Yahoo had some ish issues with it. When you have this host list here, which is the available possible host uh, or hypervisors that you can schedule on, it gets to be uh, somewhat interesting when you're in the thousands of hosts and especially when you have a, a legacy system that you have lots of like the amount of bare metal that we had previously that was managed by this legacy system you can imagine it's hundreds of thousands <laughs> or it's at least more than tens greater than 50 I can't give exact numbers because I don't even know them anymore but it's a lot and when you have to run these filter processes over that many in hosts uh, it started to become a bottleneck 
there was some issues that we can talk about. I think maybe you can go into yeah, more. Yeah, I'll, I'll on cover one. that uh, in uh, next slides. Sure. So this is, the filtering process itself is pretty straightforward. I think if you haven't looked at it, it's basically getting the host and then running a bunch of filters over those hosts. Each filter is supposed to uh, reduce the amount of hosts that are available in that list. And then at the final point, you have some set of uh, target hosts, and then you, there may be an actual picking of one of those to be the selected host. Now, this may not be an accurate guess, so that's why the retry stuff that I talked about previously may get activated, and then it may go back through this a little bit and continue for as many times as it's configured to go. I don't forget how many times it's supposed yep. to go by default. So this is a little, you want to go through some of the filters? So yeah, so uh, we talked about the filters and ways in the last slide. So uh, we just have this uh, consolidated diagram of uh, how filters and what filters are there in uh, in OpenStack or in NOAA. So uh, in resource filter, you have core filter, RAM filter, disk filter. RAM filter will mention, uh, uh, give you idea about how much RAM is available, how much RAM uh, is occupied. And uh, similarly, you have some affinity filters like, uh, uh, in a U at, when operating at a U scale, you would like to place your instance at this particular rack or this particular hypervisor. So you have uh, affinity filters, that is server group affinity filters. You have anti-affinity filters. Don't boot my instance on this particular hypervisor. And then you have some topology filters, like you want to do some grouping based off availability zone or aggregates. So you have avail availability zone filters. You want to boot VMs in a particular availability zone or a particular aggregate. Right, and uh, there there is also this uh, interesting um, image isolation filter, which can be like if you want to boot Windows in OpenStack, so you isolate it by that. So you have compute filters, which is basically saying uh, what whether the sub, uh, service is running on or not. Yeah, and there's another one that's sort of interesting in there is this retry filter. Retry that's, filter. That, that one's sort the, of special in that it actually is doing the logic to boot out the, like, if you have retried, gone through that retry loop that we were talking about, like, more than X times, it will stop the whole the whole process. And then I forget, I think it goes, your instance goes into uh, no, not found. Or, no uh, valid host no found. No valid host found, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. And that will then end up being shown back to the user. It's a interesting little special filter <laughs> that is uh, yeah. Problematic, but some of the stuff that we had to do at Yahoo, I think we'll go into a little bit here. But this is a little bit more of the process, how it goes, how the whole filtering uh, process works, sort of what we went over. Yeah, so this is more of an algorithm, more in depth, and uh, I think uh, we covered in the last slide. But if you if you walk through the algorithm, we at first get the list of filtered hosts, depending on the two inputs that is request and the host state. Then uh, the filtering logic applies uh, whatever filter you have configured. Then uh, weights are applied, and then one host is selected. And then uh, you put that host in the list of selected hosts, as you see in the uh, right on the right side arrow. And then the in-memory host state map is updated. And uh, this is one of the the updating host state map is one of the things that slows the pro uh, pro scheduler down. So uh, and that is one of the problem for the slowness of the scheduler. So, yeah. so let's look at some of the performance tests we did uh, to measure the results and uh, see how the scheduler behaves. So maybe I can go through this. To, so the uh, performance test, so we uh, had 500 nodes uh, inventory. This was a fake inventory and 50 concurrent boots and one filter scheduler. So the throughput of one filter scheduler for 500 nodes and 50 concurrent boots is 2.81 requests per second. If we increase the number of nodes, it goes to 1.67 requests per second. This is pretty low. And uh, if we, if uh, like when when we measured the amount of time spent by the scheduler process individually, because in order to boot, there are as we see in the saw in the chain, there are multiple processes like no API conductor scheduler, and then going back to conductor and again compute. It seems that uh, the and there is also the messaging layer involved, which we haven't. Uh, uh, spoken about, but that's the uh, glue that connects everything. So the NOAA scheduler itself consumes 68 to 75 percent of the uh, overall schedule process in 500 nodes, uh, whereas it's, it consumes 85 to 95 percent in overall schedule process for 1,000 nodes, which is like, which is, uh, sorry? Is the percent time? Yeah, it's the amount of time it uh, takes. So. So uh, when we uh, when I, when we analyzed more, it looks like the get all host state in filter scheduler cost about 88 to 95 percent of the total time the scheduler takes. So which is immense, and uh, that is taken by majorly accesses to DB and updating the in-memory cache. So the bottleneck is the cache refreshing step that is present in the scheduler, which 
pulls the data from the DB, and then tries to update the cache. So database calls are biggest bottleneck during scheduling. Till the time we fix it, uh, scheduler can work well and good at uh, at the scale of 50 host, 100 host, or 200 host. But if you are trying to operate at a scale of Yahoo or even OpenStack wants to reach at a bigger scale for 1,000 nodes or more than that, uh, it's not going to work. So challenges, scheduling virtual machines. So as we saw in the previous slide, uh, uh, scheduler cache implementation, there's a bottleneck in cache refreshing step. So time consuming database block during every decision making process, which results in slowing down everything. That's like the event loads, is that also partially <coughs> yeah. related to event load stuff? Yeah, so uh, which, and then, uh, so uh, there have been one more proposal uh, in the uh, NOAA scheduler of using caching scheduler. So why not use caching scheduler? Why every time go to DB, fetch the data, and update the host states? So cache, caching scheduler implementation is very naive. So it's unsuitable for rapidly changing compute node resources, where you have multiple concurrent boots going on, and you want to spin up more VMs or more instances to, instances to serve your application. So it refreshes after every 60 seconds. So uh, which is not a good idea. And running multiple scheduler or having multiple cache uh, caches and then uh, information stored in the cache and then having inconsistent behavior is is not acceptable. So challenges scheduling virtual machines uh, in Juno, uh, specifically in Juno, node selection time is directly proportional to the number of nodes you have in your inventory. And uh, this is, uh, so the time complexity is polynomial. If you have 1,000 nodes, it will take hundred uh, like uh, 20 seconds. If you have... Uh, 10,000 nodes, it will take uh, it will take uh, 50 seconds. If you have more than that, it will take 100 seconds. So time ke keeps on growing in, uh, increasingly as you have more number of nodes in the inventory. And uh, as a result of which, eventually the boot request might time out depending on what RPC timeout you have configured. But eventually it's low, it's like 180 seconds or so. So this is not acceptable. So uh, the solution for that that we used or we worked on was to have a cache of aggregate to hosted data because aggregate data is not uh, like you is not part of the hosted information and uh, you need uh, we made the change to have the cache for aggregate and hosted mapping and the filter order is also important uh, the way the filter filtering works is it works from left to right that is in this case the aggregate image isolation filter will work first will get applied first then the availability zone filter will get applied and so on and the way you want to uh, organize your filters is that the first filter should should separate or should remove most of the host so that eventually you can uh, filter out, uh, have less host to work on, and uh, that will help. So looking ahead, I think uh, Josh can, we can go ahead. a little it. quick thing here. Yeah. Uh, since we're at most of that time, but we were th the next step that I was starting to start to propose was how do we work around the limitations of the scheduler? There's not just the Nova scheduler, there's, a, there's similar diagrams you can have for other projects as well, uh, which leads to this lack of a, a somewhat more optimized solution or even the possibility of it. So there's been various proposals that, I, that have been started by various folks, but I started the recent one about having, how do we figure out how to do this in a more organized manner? I think the Nova people are working on some resource groups as well. Resource pools, resource, resource providers. Pools, resource providers. So those are all working toward this kind of solution. So I think it'll be interesting to see when we come back in a year from now what will actually be the target state of this thing. It's a little hard to tell right now, but I think the, there's definitely these known problems are, are are aware to most Yeah, folks. so solving the consistent state problem, and if you have any alternatives to the filter scheduler, because that is slowing everything down, and then, uh, yeah, uh, a few other things, yeah. yeah Thank so you. I think that's about it. We can talk later, or if you want to ask questions, we can we can help you uh, connect you right to the right folks, and any help is appreciated. So sure. Thank you. Thank you.